Well, my next guest is from a sporting dynasty. Despite his father, Barry Hearn, claiming his son was born with a silver spoon, Eddie Hearn has grown the family business, signing boxing's first billion-dollar deal, become one of the sport's most recognisable faces around the world, including America. But just how far will the promoter go to follow the money? Saudi Arabia's so-called sports-watching empire is expanding across football, Formula One, golf and, of course, boxing. And there's now a reported $1 billion offer for Paris Saint-Germain's Kylian Mbappe. Should we be afraid of the Saudi world takeover? Well, I'm delighted to say Eddie Hearn is joining me live, uncensored, in the studio. Welcome, Eddie. Good evening. Great to see you. Um, this whole th Saudi thing has been fascinating to me. Watching Live Golf, for example, take on the PGA and basically batter the PGA into submission. Watching Formula One embracing all the money from the Middle East. And then my friend Cristiano Ronaldo mm. going out to Saudi and really transforming world football. You look at all the stars going there now, following Ronaldo. As he said, it could be the fifth best league in the world within a year. It is extraordinary to watch. Should we be concerned about this? What's your view of this Saudi domination of world sport? I mean, we, we first went there in 2019 with Anthony Joshua against Andy Ruiz in the rematch. Got a lot of criticism, obviously. I don't like to position boxing differently to golf or tennis, but it's prize fighting. And our job is to obviously maximise the earnings of a fighter over a short period of time. What I've learned through my work out there is you've got a lot of passionate people about sport. The political argument of sports washing and so forth. Now, I don't want to push that away and say, I'm, I, you know, that's not my responsibility. I don't see that as much. I see a group of people in charge of certain sports that are ultimately huge fans with a yeah. unparalleled budget. And people in boxing that have actually worked amongst the grassroots, it's up 300% for boxing clubs. I think they've quadrupled the number of amateur boxing clubs, etc. But it's just people in charge who have a huge passion for a sport. I was there three or four weeks ago talking boxing in, in, you know, in, in Prince Khalid's house, who, who runs the boxing. They're all watching football. Unbelievable uh, football fans. Well, Ronaldo We've... told me that the, the fans, it's incredible. He said the stadiums are packed out, the fans go crazy, they're very knowledgeable, the quality of the football is better than he thought it was, and he's obviously massively improving with all these signings, he's got all these top players going. There's no doubt they're on a mission to be very dominant in the sport. Do you see a downside to this? Well, when you see Mbappe potentially going for one season, mm. if he accepts this deal for a billion dollars, most people will think this is completely insane. They would see it as a marketing play. Yeah, I, I see. I think we can talk about it, we can debate it, we can talk about the pros and cons, but all of it's irrelevant. It's not going away. Right. This is a group of very determined individuals who want to make Saudi Arabia the forefront of global sport. And they have the budget to do it at every single level. And is there a lot of hypocrisy? The reason I ask that, take someone like Jordan Henderson, mm -hmm. who's just gone to play in Saudi. I remember at the Qatar World Cup, he said, when we were given the briefing on Qatar, which is really important, it was shocking and disappointing. It's horrendous, really, when you look at some of the issues that are currently happening and have been happening over there. All sounds great, right to the point. He then gets on a plane and goes and plays in Saudi Arabia. He's put his morals to one side and his concerns. Is there a lot of hypocrisy? I believe there is. Yeah. I think that if you look at most countries around the world, us included, you know, we, if you go to Qatar like I did and talk to the locals, they say, well, what about your illegal invasion of Iraq? Mm. Who gives you the right to put a halo on your heads? Yeah, and I think every country has their problem. Obviously, Saudi Arabia, perhaps more so from a human rights issue, but also sometimes I return to this country and look at the problems we have here right. and prefer to worry about that. I think when we talk about sport, you know, like I said, this isn't going away. This is a group of people that are very determined to make an impact. Is it good or bad? Let's be honest. What I didn't like about Liv particularly was the press conferences that were held yeah. where people were talking and glorifying the format and the change in, you know, in structure, moving from the PGA Tour to Liv Tour. Let's just be completely honest. And by the way, I don't blame these people. Mm. It's a huge amount of money that will set them up, their kids, generations for mm. years and years beyond. Who can actually blame Ronaldo or Mbappe for taking a deal like that? Mm. You can celebrate ones that don't because of other issues or, or because of, you know, a moral principle. But at the end of the day, in all business, and sport is business as well, money talks and they're not going to be able to reject this amount of money over time. Why has money not yet talked Anthony Joshua fighting Tyson Fury? Um, I think it's a lot of things. I think Tyson Fury, who... 
I'm saying he's slowly being found out, but he's not always as truthful as he appears on Instagram. Timing is, is something. I think television rights and partnerships are something. Um, Instagram is something. Ego is very much Everybody something. Everybody wants well. to see this Everybody fight. wants to see it. And on August 12th, Anthony Joshua will fight Dillian White mm. on the zone. After that, he will fight Deontay Wilder mm. in Saudi Arabia. And then after that, it has to be Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury turned down the Alexander Usyk fight, the biggest fight, really, the most important fight in boxing, the undisputed heavyweight world championship, to fight an MMA fighter who's never had a fight before in his life, also in Saudi Arabia. We've got to be honest. Tyson Fury cares about one thing only, the money. Right, don't talk to me about legacy. Don't talk to me about undisputed. Don't talk to me about... But he has banged care. over everybody out really? there. Really? Who? Well, who everybody out there? Well, Wilder, who okay. your boy's going to so, fight. So he's beat Klitschko and Wilder. That's his wins. He needs to beat Usyk and AJ, and then we can talk about him, as I believe he is, as one of the greatest heavyweights mm. of all time. Listen, he's unbelievable. What he's come back from, incredible. Couldn't commend him more. But to create a legacy, to create that history, to go down as a modern-day great, to put yourselves up with Ali, with Lennox Lewis, with Joe Frazier, those guys, mm. he's got to beat Usyk. And he's got to beat Anthony Joshua, but particularly Usyk, who's the undisputed champion. Well, I think he will beat Usyk. He'll fight him and beat him. And then the real fight I want to see is him and Joshua. Let's, get through, let's get through Dillian White first. Yes. <laughs> let's talk about you, because I, I got to know you and your dad. We, we holiday in the same place, and uh, I've seen how competitive you are, even at playing golf with each other. You were brought up in a very similar atmosphere as a family to the one that I've tried with my kids, that my parents tried with me, where... It was tough love, you know, like no quarter was given. Your dad wanted you to be successful and he felt the best way to do it was, for example, he put a cricket net in your garden and bowled as fast as he could. He's a very good cricketer and could bowl quick. When you were like young kid, 11, 12 years old, then when you were 16, he'd been boxing for a few years, he said, we're going to have a fight, you and me, in the ring. And the pair of you get in a ring and have a proper match. And first of all, what happened in that fight? Well... You know, I was a, a big kid. I mean, I'm six foot five now. But he always said to me, look, you, know, you have to understand, and people... There was, a, there was an article in The Garden recently where the, the writer kind of failed to understand my child. Mm. It wasn't normal. And as I get older, I realise more and more it actually wasn't normal, but it worked for us. My dad was from Dagenham, right? The one thing he hated more than anything growing up mm. was a sport kid, right? A rich kid who had everything. Mm. And he was petrified that I was going to be that kid. Mm. So he drilled into me work ethic, working class mentality. You get given nothing. Winning is everything. Mm. And I was brought up on sport. You know, it was the one thing that taught me discipline, manners, respect, winning, losing. Of course, physical health, mental health, all of that stuff, working as a team. And that's why I'm so passionate about that for the next generation. But, you know, he always said to me, when you get to 18... I'm going to take you down to the gym and I'm going to give you a complete pasting. He said, you're a soft, silver spoon, sport kid, <laughs> and I'm from Dagenham and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take, take you to school. So I said, all right, I understand. And I boxed a little bit. You know, I thought I was good, but I was terrible. But I got to 16 and I was already six foot. I was on a 14 stone. He said, look, we need to bring it forward a couple of years. Because so he was worried. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit of a lump. So we went down to the Romford Boxing Gym and there was fighters down there. And we put on these little gloves and we got in the, the ring. And the bell went. We were doing three two-minute rounds. And the bell rang. And he, I'll, I'll never forget, because he came at me, and I've never seen such determination and grit to inflict damage. On his own side? Yeah. And the teeth were grit, you know, and he was banging away, and I was taking shots. And Anyway, beat me up for the first round. And in the second round, he was completely gone. He was out of gas. And I, I left up to the body, took one knee, got up, done him again, and he was counted out. <laughs> and the next day, it's in every paper. And he's told... He couldn't have been prouder. You know, normally, if your son gives you a bit of a mm. pasting, you'd, you'd sort of want to keep it a bit quiet. He, he was so proud that... And how did you feel about the whole thing? I knew, you know, again, he, he'd done a job on me growing up, you know, with, with the right mentality. But, you know, he was like, you're one of us. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. how he felt. Yeah. And, and the problem is, is, you know, sport is the answer for something. We were talking in, in, the, mm. you know, in the green room. Sport is the answer. For me. Totally agree. For the growth, the education and mould. I mean, I'm so mental passionate... mental health, about the boxing, resilience for all of it. Boxing in the community. Now, politicians, the government, they don't go to these clubs. No. Please. Now, if you go in there and see the types of kids that are in these clubs and speak to every fighter that exists, mm. and some of them, obviously, 
or, or a bigger torch than others. Anthony Joshua, great example. Got in trouble with the police, got arrested, stumbled across Finchley ABC. Didn't go in there to be heavyweight world champion. Mm. Went in there for some direction, some hope, that family feeling that a boxing gym gives you, you know? And through it, actually became Olympic champion and world heavyweight champion. But every fighter that we represent will tell you the same story. Boxing changed or boxing saved my life. That goes across all sports. What do you feel about two issues about sport right now? One, that at school, everyone gets a participation prize, even if they come last. Secondly, boys now race against girls, which I think is completely ridiculous. Many schools have gone down this way. Unisex sports day, which I think is ridiculous. And then you have the, the ongoing issue of transgender athletes in sport dominating biological females mm. in women's sport. Let's take the first one. Well, let's take the last one first, the transgender issue. What do you feel about that as a sports promoter? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm of the old school mentality where, you know, of course, male athletes compete against male athletes, female athletes compete against uh, female athletes. It's an awkward conversation to have. It's not about a level... I mean, when you talk about physical sports, mm. there is no way... And boxing is a great example. We haven't had that problem yet in well, boxing. Well, if Mike Tyson suddenly turned around and said, <coughs> I, I'm now Michelle Tyson mm. and I'm going to compete as a woman, mm. the world would go completely crazy mm. and say, you're going to kill somebody, you're going to kill a woman. But we seem to be perfectly OK with six-foot-four-inch swimmers. Mm. My biological males yeah. dominating Bit women's sports. Bizarre. Sprinters, shouldn't be weightlifters. Bizarre, shouldn't be allowed. And ultimately, you know, whoever you upset, you upset. But not sport, not, not, not a fair sport, not, not a fair race, not a fair competition. It's, to me, it's, it's the same as doping. It's, 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 you're giving it's yourself a physical edge. advantage. Exactly, which, of course, can't be allowed. Um, Kids and participation prizes at school. <laughs> if you come last... When I, I mean, I used to win the non-finalist race on Sports Day, which was for all the losers, but I used to make sure I was the best loser, right? Because mm. I wasn't an athlete. My two brothers used to win everything, and my sons have been very good at Sports Day, but I, I wasn't. But I remember the pain of losing, and I wanted to be the best, mm. at least the best loser. But this idea that if you come last, you still get a little prize because they can't be upset... Mm. This, this mindset is where I think this country is going so wrong. Yeah, and I, I'm, a, I'm a bad person to ask because I couldn't be more on your side and on your page. <clears throat> winning, this is how I grew up, mm. winning is everything. Right. It's, not, it's the only thing that matters. Whatever you do, win. Yes. And that's the attitude we have in sport, in business, doesn't matter if I'm playing my old man over a game of table tennis, he's diving on the floor. You know, it is absolute do or die. Winning is everything. I struggle having two daughters, especially, and one is very good at football, and she'll get taken off in matches because we have to give everybody a yeah, game. But I hate that. I know. Why? I, Why has she like, been punished for I, her I ability? Agree, but it's so difficult, you know. I mean, on one stage, we talk about the, the importance of sport yeah. and we talk about encouragement. You can't close the door to a young kid. No, but you tell the young kid, if you want to be as I good know. as that kid, I here's agree, what you've I got to do. You, but at the same time, we, we, we don't want to close don't the Don't sacrifice your principles. No, I will never. And, and you know, as my old <laughs> don't man... Don't let them take your daughter off. My old man ref referred to me recently as a project, you know, and that, that was like, that's his thing, you know, it's about winning. And, and we have that mentality. What we must do is we must continue to create winners. Mm. Because if it's in sport, if it's in business... In everything. In, in life. And, and, you know, unfortunately now we live in a world where everybody actually tries to bring the winners down and deflate the winners, you know, make sure they but this, of... But this thing of having a school on sports day, boys competing with girls, I think is Mental. complete madness. Yeah, complete madness. What, what are you what? trying to do to these girls? Yeah. Kill their self-esteem? Yeah. Tell them they're not as good as boys simply because the boys have a physical advantage? Mm. I think all of it is wrong. I think completely wrong. And also on the winning argument, ultimately... Kids need to be told. Winning, you know, I used to come home from a game of cricket, and my old man would go to me, how'd you get on? I'd go, oh, no good, got a good ball, got four. Useless. Right. What's the matter with you? Go out there tomorrow and go and knock in 100. Right. Right? And that was it. That was life. You but know, that, to me, like... is about teaching someone to, to, A, to want to compete properly. Why bother entering anything that's competitive if you don't want to win? And why is winning such a bad thing these days, right? Nowadays, people who lose get celebrated. Mm. If they quit... They get more celebrated isn't that, isn't than if that, they compete. But that's a classic British trait, isn't it? We, we, we really do glorify our greatest losers. Almost mm. like, I mean, Frank Bruno's a great example. Was one of the most popular, you know, char characters, sportsmen in this country. Won a world heavyweight title. Actually, people sort of went, oh, 
he's won the World Heavyweight title. Yeah. It was like a bit of a disappointment. Yeah. Our Frank, <laughs> who couldn't really ever win a World Heavyweight title, has won one. I mean, I feel, I feel like Andy Murray suffers from mm. that a little bit, yeah. you know, through his success. I mean, Tim Hemman, another example, mm. good old Tim, couldn't quite win, win Wimbledon. Mm. We love him. Yeah. You know, and that, that's sometimes the British mentality. We need to move more towards educating young people that, you know, you have to achieve. You, you on, your, on your cabinet, in your office, you have a school board, Eddie v Barry school board. Boxing skills, it says, 1-0 to Eddie. You, obviously, you, you beat him. Snooker skills, 1-0 to Barry. He beats you at snooker. Instagram followers, 62 Barry, 1.2 million Eddie. <laughs> Amazon book, I love this, Amazon book reviews, 33 Barry, 1,370 for Eddie. Height, well, obviously, you're taller than him. Golf handicap, uh, you're now beating him. So, actually, you're quite ahead now on the metric. Yeah. But I'll tell you one very quick story about my old man, which the book is the one, right? Mm -hmm. So, I get asked to write a book. It's called Relentless. It's about... You know, my work ethic, my love for the business, for sport, all that kind of stuff. Wrote it in three months with a ghostwriter during lockdown, right? He's been writing his for nine or ten years. You know, I won't want to embarrass him, but I made significantly more money for my fee to write the book than he did. But what he said was, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take more money on commission. So I'm going to make more money than you. After the book was written, fantastic book, took him six or seven years to write the book. It was, I must recommend. He drove around the country with books in the boot and was knocking them out at <laughs> events to try and outsell me, right? I think I'd done 60,000, he'd done 8,000 in the end. But this is what I'm up against, you know. He yeah, was but like... I get the feeling, though, because you have such a lovely relationship. I've seen it at first hand. And you're very similar in many ways. And he just wanted you to be the best you could possibly be. Mm. Even if that meant you were more successful than him, I don't think he really minded that. He just never wanted you to shortchange yourself, right? Mm. He wanted you to be the best competitive beast that he could possibly yeah, empower and, you to be. And he wants me, you know, he wants to be a grafter. He wants to mm. win. And that's the, the thing with business now. You know, we are, we, he might say to me, how'd you get on at Dallas Cowboys? You know, how many turned up to that Canelo fight? Mm. You know, and he'll say, well, have you seen the ratings for the darts? Smashed your boxing. <laughs> and it's like, Dad, we're in the same company. You know, but that's that. But I'm like this with my sons, you know? right? Yeah, but that's you know, the if I go to cricket yeah. net with my boys, they'll try and kill me. Yeah. I mean, but I want, I want nothing else. I don't want them giving me anything. I don't want to give them anything. When I play table tennis with my daughter, who's 11, I want to beat her mm. so that when she finally beats me, she knows she beat me trying to beat her. That will mean so much more than if I just let her win. Yeah. That's exactly what happens around my old man's house on a Sunday. Just want to ask you quickly about Conor Ben because I interviewed him on this this show. He's one of your your fighters. I got to say, I I ended that interview really just not sure what to believe, but actually veering slightly, I felt in my gut that he might be telling the truth that he has been the victim of a miscarriage of justice here over this uh, suggestion that he took uh, illicit drugs. You believe in him? Why? Why are you so convinced? Because I've known Conor Ben since he was. 18, 19 years of age, since he came over from Australia on his own, mm -hmm. left his mum and dad there to make a name for himself in boxing. The meticulous nature of his preparation, you know, his love of the sport, um, you know, his deep faith, all of the things, the way he trains with Tony Sims, the closeness of their relationship, the way that he was so insistent on additional testing that he paid for going into this fight. And the amount of times that I've sat with this young man in my office and watched him break down in tears yeah, he did on, on the, the floor. And, and for me to question him, I didn't believe him. As soon as, you know, this you've is... Been, because you've been criticised mm. because you've always ripped into Absolutely. other cheating and, boxes. Because you know what, in, in, in this instance and in life in general, guilty until proven innocent. My first reaction was, I can't believe it. He, would, like, he, he wouldn't do that. Do you believe and, he'll be exonerated? I do. And I believe, you know, he went through the right procedure with the WBC and VADA. That's who did the test. He was cleared, he was reinstated in the rankings. Everyone said, oh, he needs to go through UCAD and the British Boxing Board of Control. He turned around and he went, OK, I'll do that as well. He spent hundreds of thousands going through that process and the result is imminent. And I believe him. And I've had... So, it's one year since the test. Every day. I mean, I've had loads of stick. He's had untold know, stick. Incredible. And if he's cleared, which I believe he will be, I hope that some people understand what he went Well, look through. at Kevin Spacey, the actor, who today got found not guilty on all these sex assault charges. He's been already convicted by the Court of Public Opinion on Twitter, mercilessly, called the most horrendous things. And today he's come out an innocent man. Mm. Twitter is, and social media generally, it's an unforgiving court that mm. just prosecutes people without seeing evidence. Mm. And I feel that a little bit about Conor Ben. It'd be interesting to see what happens on that. Before I let you go, 
How much are you worth? Me? If you died tomorrow. I don't know. And I don't yes, care. you do. I don't know. Yes, I mean, you do, Eddie Hearn. We're doing all right. You know to the nearest I tell you penny. What, I tell you what, we're doing all right, but I work like I'm skinned every day. That's a good one. That's a good one. And if you were Prime Minister, which many people think you should be, and you couldn't do a <laughs> worse job than the Tories have done the last 10 years, let's be honest, what's the first thing you'd do to fix this country? The first thing I would do would be to increase participation in sport for young children. Our young kids are in a terrible, terrible yeah. situation. Social media, disaster. Twitter, toxic. Mm. You know, everybody that has ambition, everybody that has desire, everybody that has a strategy in their mind gets derailed by negativity by people who can't do it. We were saying, I put a video out just before we yeah. came on over, me and you, right, and immediately in comes the abuse. Yeah. About both of us, right? Uh, now, we can handle it. We've got thick skins. I think that I say the one quality I really have is great is I've got an incredibly thick skin. It just, it just washes off me. Most people I know in the public eye find it really hard. But, but you know, we can say we've got a thick skin, which we have. Mm. You have, I have. But after waking up every morning, it was a, it was a great... We, we said, you know, you wake up in a great mood. You have a, it's like, <laughs> what, what on earth am I reading here? What is going on? Yeah. And, and that... There's no point in infiltrating yourself with negativity. Life's mm. too short. We can handle it. Kids can't. No. That's the difference. And they're no. being bombarded with constant negative Non-stop. stuff. And the algorithms of content, which yeah. is ultimately designed to feed the way they think. Yeah, you, see, you see girls who are talking to each other about self-harming. Yeah. Next thing, TikTok is sending them loads of stuff disaster. on self-harming. Total it, disaster. It's, it's feeding a, a horrible yeah. thing. We, and we, you know, parents have to make sure that you limit that time. And we have to educate the mm. kids. And I think the best way to educate is through sport. Every time you see a kid put down their phone agree. and participate I agree. with energy, with a smile on their face, with a desire to win and compete, it's the greatest thing to watch. And whether it's boxing, which I'm a, a massive fan mm. of, or you know, the government need to make sure that we keep the opportunities because inner city schools just don't have a sporting system. They don't. System. They don't. And, I and went from a fee-paying prep school at, at 12, 13 to comprehensive, and I went from playing three hours of sport a day to nothing once a week if someone could find any kit or a teacher. Just not good enough. Mm. This country has to do that. I think sport is the answer, actually. Okay. It's good for well-being, it's good for physical, for mental, everything. Eddie, I could talk to you all night. And I felt your guns earlier. You I mean, did feel my guns. Level. And in fact, you would say, why are you not, why are you not competing? I, I, need, I, need your, I need your schedule. Thank you. Well, you may see my pinned tweet on Twitter, which is Ronaldo telling me what great abs I've got. Okay. Uh, no, he knows all about abs. Eddie, great to see you. Thank you. Come back again, I loved it. Uh, we yes. should do more, I really appreciate it. And you're so right about all of it. Thank you. Yes.